So, good morning everyone, and I'm happy to introduce our invited speaker, Andreas Krause. Um, he's a professor in computer science at ETH Zurich, leading research in machine learning, and he is academic co-director of the Swiss Data Science Center and chair of the ETH AI Center. He earned his PhD at CMU and a diploma in CS and mathematics from the Technical University of New York, Munich, and he also was an assistant professor at, at Caltech. He's a Max Planck Fellow, ACM Fellow, and Ellis Fellow. He won several awards, including the Rosler Prize, Test of Time Awards, not just one, but two, one in KDD 2019 and ICML 2020. And he served as program chair for ICML 2018. I'm fortunate to co-chair it with him. Um, and general chair for ICML 2023, action editor for General R, and he was also appointed to the UN high level advisory body on AI. And we're all excited to have him because we've done a lot of his famous works in Safe RL and also on top of the optimization. And today he's going to talk about his work on Bayesian optimization uh, for estimating and optimizing functions from noisy data. So let's welcome Andreas Krause. Thank you so much uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, great to be here. Um, I'm spending some time here in the uh, Boston area uh, for my sabbatical, so it's wonderful to uh, be around here and meet all the great people around. Um, <clears throat> today I'd like to tell you about some work that we've been doing, not on CFRL and not on submodular optimization, but around Bayesian optimization, experimental design, and more generally sort of putting machine learning in the discovery loop. I'm going to say what that means. Uh, so probably many of you will agree that these are really exciting uh, times for learning-based approaches towards uh, artificial intelligence and far beyond tasks like image classification or specialized tasks like machine translations, these systems can now engage in multi-turn dialogue, can generate photorealistic images or even videos from caption and uh, from so, uh, from text. Uh, and we've seen the first uh, amazing inroads into scientific applications, AlphaFold is super exciting, many other exciting works uh, in this space. Now, for those of you uh, in machine learning, right, uh, you probably agree that kind of the most prominent paradigm of machine learning roughly works like this. We would start with a bunch of data, maybe for supervised learning, a bunch of pairs of images and uh, labels someone provided. We would fit a model to it, maybe a neural network, and then we hope that if we apply that model to test data that's sort of well represented by the training data, you can hope for decent uh, generalization. And even now, sort of talking about generative AI and language models and these things, the paradigm hasn't really changed that much. Maybe we'll extract the labels themselves from our training data We're using self-supervision, but by and large, it's the same. But of course, for machine learning to work, we need data, right? And data is absolutely essential. And so it's another question of where does this data come from? And so the question that has excited me for much of my research career is really this question of how can we use algorithms themselves so think about collecting and working with data. Right? You'd really put machine learning in it. So you can, for example, ask, how should we actively collect data that's sort of useful for fitting predictive models, right? Maybe that are giving us good predictions over a set of examples that we care about, or that are useful for tasks like optimization or control. And so that's what going to, going to be the main focus of today's talk. Uh, so we are looking at both kind of theoretical aspects of these questions, but also have been engaging in a number of applications, typically in interdisciplinary uh, contexts. So one of the first settings uh, where I got to work on these type of questions was back during my PhD days. So using kind of robotics to adaptively monitoring uh, spatial phenomena like um, uh, for example, algal blooms uh, in lakes. And so there's questions of how should you plan informative paths to collect sensor uh, measurements. Uh, we've been uh, doing some work in precision agriculture. So for example, the bottom left shows uh, a postdoc of mine, Matteo, uh, working with the Swiss Office for Agriculture on informing experimental design campaigns for uh, learning what crops to grow where under what conditions, for example, and how to manage them optimally. Uh, but there's lots of exciting uh, questions, uh, maybe really where this, loop is at the heart of it uh, in the context of scientific applications. And so in the top right, this is a collaboration uh, that we have with the Paul Scherer Institute, a large federal research facility in Switzerland. We've been using the algorithms developed around Bayesian optimization, safe Bayesian optimization for controlling uh, their free electron laser. 
um, and the bottom right, it's going to be the key motivating application for much of what we're going to talk about later, is really sort of this vision of kind of self-driving labs using AI itself to guide uh, scientific uh, discovery. So lots of really uh, exciting challenges uh, there, and this is um, Amami Mutni who's been uh, involved in a bunch of the research I'm going to talk about today. And so, to dive right in, so one of the motivating applications will be to sort of use machine learning to aid protein design. So various different applications from drug discovery to chemical catalysis. We'll talk about some of those. And so uh, one way to do this is through the lens of what's called direct uh, evolution. Uh, and so there you would take a wild type protein and consider modifying it certain ways, maybe swapping out certain amino acids by another, so basically applying uh, different mutations to it that would uh, yield mutated proteins, which you can subject to different environmental conditions and measure the outcomes. And based on these outcomes, you can then drive experimental campaigns. And the goal would be to, for example, try to find enzymes that are good at a particular task, right? Maybe bind with respect to certain receptor molecules, right? Maybe also have higher thermal stability, don't decay in uh, environmental conditions, uh, have nice catalytic properties uh, and the likes. And doing this from scratch often is difficult because this is a large combinatorial space of possible uh, kind of mutations you could uh, think about and the possible designs to think about. So it's very question, lots of questions on how can you reuse data from sort of similar experiments that have been done? Or how can we can sort of combine experimental targets like measurements from actual wet lab experiments and in situ calculations, maybe uh, using uh, uh, kind of molecular dynamics and sort of related uh, approaches. And so these are topics we're going to touch in this uh, in this talk from a methodological standpoint. And so in kind of a super high level cartoon, you might think about this problem of kind of optimizing uh, protein fitness, right? That's one where you sort of have uh, the uh, range of possible designs on the x-axis. You have some abstract notion of performance, like thermal stability or binding affinity, and there's some sort of unknown function, right, that describes this fitness landscape. And the problem is you can only access it through samples, and these samples require wet lab experiments, which are generally expensive. And so the question is, how should we sort of experiment to collect this information in order to kind of find well-performing designs quickly? Right? And so one mathematical abstraction of this that's been looked at in literature is kind of through this lens of black box optimization, right? So this fitness landscape, we don't, we can't calculate gradients, right? You can really only carry out experiments. So it's really sort of like a black box to us. We can subject it to some inputs, like candidate proteins, maybe a different set of uh, mutations to consider, and then evaluate some noisy response, right? So this fitness landscape perturbed by some no noise, which we'll assume to be sort of reasonably nicely behaved, like ceramines of Gaussian, Martingale different sequences, these kind of things. Okay, and so the typical assumption will be evaluating this black box is expensive, right? And sort of algorithmic choices around kind of where to probe it are relatively cheap in comparison to that. That's sort of a common uh, computational abstraction. And of course, the question is sort of how should we probe in order to find good designs quickly? And one notion is often looked at is this notion of regret, right? It's basically the opportunity cost of not knowing the true fitness landscape, the sum of instantaneous regret to optimality gaps compared to the optimal one. Now, here's sort of one maybe conceptual picture, right? It's a cartoon, uh, bear with me. But sort of one common approach in machine learning would be to say, let's collect a bunch of data, maybe uh, a bunch of data shown here, and sort of fit a model to it. And the model is going to be good sort of where you have data. And you could use it in order to maybe rank, make predictions, right, which direction, for example, to go, right? Maybe go in this direction to sort of try to improve on your designs, right, with some sort of local optimization, right? And sort of regions that are well represented by this training data would expect these models to. But arguably, if you want to kind of do discovery, right, you want to go where no one has gone before, right? You want to go in parts of the design space that you don't have data, right? Where kind of your models, uh, really possible learned representations would really break down. And that's really sort of the heart of the challenge. I think it's also a key challenge of testing and sort of benchmarking machine learning. Because in a way, you want to use learning where it's known to not work, right? You want to use it to make predictions in parts of the domain that are really out of distribution, that are really far away. And so there's lots of predictors, right, that would maybe predict the uh, performance of uh, this particular molecule over here, right? Um, uh, but they're all consistent where you have training data, but they wildly uh, vary where you don't have data. So it's, what's really crucial is to kind of capture and make use of that uncertainty somehow, right? And that's really a key motivation behind 
what's often referred to as Bayesian optimization. Uh, and the key idea behind uh, this approach is to basically really try to quantify that uncertainty, right? That's of epistemic nature due to lack of information, and then use the uncertainty in order to guide this trade off between explorations or collecting data that helps me fit better models and sort of narrowing down where I would find uh, good solutions quickly. Right. And so now to do this, we need sort of two things, right? One is kind of uncertainty quantification, right? Maybe a good probabilistic model of this unknown function and uh, sort of a way to navigate, right? To make use of this uncertainty to resolve this exploration expectation trade off. Okay. And so this is typically done by what's called an acquisition function. It's sort of a surrogate objective function that in a way inspects this probabilistic model and produces an index, right? That says how good a particular experiment might uh, be. And now to operationalize this, there's many different ways uh, how one can do this, and it does have to be explored in the literature. So generally, one needs kind of this probabilistic model, right, that uh, in a way basically treats this unknown objective, potentially also unknown constraints or so, in a way as a sample path of some probabilistic model um, out of infinite, right, one out of infinite many sample paths. And then once you have collected data, you can sort of condition on it and your uncertainty will contract. And one model that's used a lot in Bayesian optimization are Gaussian process models. Many of you will be familiar with Gaussian process models, uh, a very popular family of sort of stochastic processes that are fully characterized by second moments, right? By basically the covariance of function responses between pairs of inputs. And that's basically um, typically assumed as sort of prior information about this movement. So you might use covariance functions like, for example, the uh, Gaussian kernel or other kernels oh. and so on. Okay, and so now why is this uncertainty useful? Here's another very important conceptual picture uh, that we'll build on later. And this is basically the following. So suppose we've collected a bunch of data shown by these pluses here, right? And co basically computed sort of our posterior prediction of this unknown function along with sort of confidence estimates that we believe sort of, that sort of the true function lies in. And if these are well calibrated, it's gonna be the case that the unknown function shown by this blue dashed line here is gonna be contained or covered by these confidence sets. Right? And then with this picture, we can sort of apply this rationale. We can sort of look at a pessimistic estimate of our optimal value, which is this dashed desk line here. And I could rest assured that the optimal solution must be somewhere above this dashed line. So within this green region of plausible optimizers, right? And that gives them some guidance in experimental design, right? You might want to, for example, gather information that would shrink this green region of plausible optimizers. And one way to operationalize this is the same optimism in the face of uncertainty principle to just pick the point that maximizes this upper confidence bound, right? That's the idea at the heart of multi armed bandits, reinforcement learning, we can apply it to uh, Bayesian optimization uh, and the likes. Okay, and so now in particular for Gaussian process models, it's very easy to sort of uh, basically enumerate uh, sort of uh, confidence sets, right? They're basically taking your mean bus a multiple the standard deviation, and that gives you an acquisition function you can optimize, right? And greedily optimize, uh, and that basically leads to this nice behavior of initially exploring things and then gradually sort of honing in to regions where you would expect um, high value. Okay, and so moreover, there's actually ways um, of, there's quite a lot of work uh, by us and others in the community on kind of both mathematical properties of these confidence sets under what condition can you really guarantee calibration? Or typically kind of if the unknown function is a member of some reproducing kind of Hilbert space that's sort of compatible with your Bayesian model, you can actually ensure this. There's ways of sort of calibrate these confidence sets to guarantee coverage. And under these sort of conditions, one can analyze actually the regrets um, of these corresponding uh, algorithms. Okay, so that's kind of a very brief intro to Bayesian optimization. A lot of what we're going to do in the rest of the talk builds on this. Here's sort of an early application of this uh, now more than 10 years ago uh, in kind of scientific discovery. And this was a, a wonderful collaboration with Frances Arnold, uh, who got the Nobel Prize for her uh, pioneering work on direct evolution and a former PhD student of hers, Phil Romero, who's now uh, faculty at uh, Wisconsin. And so he's been basically using a hand-designed kernel function for this Gaussian process that would capture things like surface so in, inductive biases like surface mutation affecting similarity less than core mutations uh, and the likes that actually work pretty well for the systems that uh, they experimented with a particular fam uh, family of enzymes called P450S um, and various chimeras of those that they created. Um, one challenge that sort of was motivated by this problem is uh, the basic algorithm and mo most basic algorithms of Bayesian optimization are really sequential. You pick one design after the next. In a lot of applications, you actually want to collect batches of experiments to carry out in parallel because it's much easier to do plates and stuff things. And now there's very interesting questions on how do you parallelize right, these kind of exploration problems, both computationally, that's this combinatorial space of possible 
uh, batches to construct, but also statistically, right, that you can sort of gain information in parallel and lots of really interesting algorithmic work one can sort of do in this space. And so this was motivated by, partly by this work. And so they actually did uh, experiments where they would start from three parent sequences, had created an initial training data sets, right, the library sample, and then in the first kind of a set of experiments, just use kind of a standard machine learning model uh, to basically predict and score uh, alternative designs and rank them, right? And that approach in, on average kind of led to better designs, but didn't actually find better designs, right? That's kind of the, the, the cartoon picture that I showed to you in data. But now sort of using kind of this iterative uh, approach and sort of fetch motivation optimization uh, through a number of kind of um, exploration rounds, eventually you're actually able to find uh, sequences that are substantially better. Well, this is, I think really one of the early, uh, maybe the earliest application of Bayesian optimizations in this domain. It's a quick question or? I mean, do you have a sense of how good the sort of caching process? Huh. Yeah, I mean, so you can look at the residuals, right? So this is sort of around the training data, right? These are sort of nice Gaussian residuals and so on that gives, provides some evidence. You can look at the, uh, the evidence of this Bayesian model in general. Um, so, uh, of course, that's always an untestable assumption, right? So, I kind of, it's in in the end, uh, it's it's a matter of how well do these models really work on data. But, so, was it hard to pick a kernel? Yeah. So, you spend quite a bit of time on sort of picking good ones, and we'll talk exactly about kind of how do you learn these things from data and so on uh, for much of the rest of the talk. So, uh, and then basically there's now a lot of really exciting work in using Bayesian optimization for discovery like properties and materials, small molecules, large molecules and the likes. Here's a recent one we've done in our collaboration with folks in Basel. Um, and so we are part of a larger research consortium in Switzerland called the NCCR Catalysis. And the goal of this consortium is really to try to find more sustainable alternatives to common catalytic pathways used in the chemical industry, but less reliant on rare metals and uh, fossil fuels. And so in this particular enzyme we've been using these techniques on, so these are artificial metallo enzymes, so basically have the potential to replace certain metal-based catalysts by essentially enzymes that are bioengineered. Um, and uh, using all sorts of uh, basically robotic equipment that sort of uh, uh, carries out these experiments uh, in parallel, now allows to scale these types of problems to a certainly larger number of experiments and the likes. And these experiments basically uh, you can substantially increase kind of both the yield and the hit rate, the probability of sort of finding well-performing enzymes that are better than sort of wild type, um, but also uh, we're actually able to find substantially better performing uh, enzymes. So this is, I think, very useful machinery for these types of problems. Once again. Uh, so this is a um, particular form of catalytic yield, basically kind of the, uh, associated with kind of this uh, catalytic reaction. So. Okay. So I would say these are kind of classical applications of Bayesian optimization, right? Both the kind of what's the machinery below and kind of how you can use them for. And now what I want to talk about in the rest of this talk, that's kind of modern challenges here in this space, right? Both on kind of where would these priors come from um, and also kind of Bayesian optimization really kind of the black box method is there any ways of kind of opening up that black box. And later on, we'll go a bit beyond kind of static tasks like bandits and Bayesian optimization to more dynamic tasks and using these ideas and lift them from Bayesian optimization to Bayesian approaches to reinforcement learning. Okay, so um, kind of the first key lesson to learn from all the successes in deep learning is that often, at least given enough data, learned representations can often do better than hand to say once. The second, learned representations are often repurposable, right? So you can learn models on image nets, say natural images, and just using a little bit of medical data I can sort of fine tune them, right? That's of course also at the heart of approaches in generative AI that you maybe train one big foundation model over the entire internet and fine tune it on certain types of data sets. So can we operationalize these ideas for tasks like vision optimization? That's sort of a very natural one to ask. And right, so in kind of to ground it again in this uh, application of sort of protein design, you could imagine that you're not just optimizing one enzyme, right, the performance of one particular molecule on a particular substrate, say, but actually uh, you might want to kind of reuse information from experimental campaigns that you've done earlier. Okay, so for example, uh, that you already have a bunch of data sets of say enzyme activity on different substrates, maybe even for different enzymes and the likes, right? And hopefully kind of learn representations that we can reuse. 
And so uh, through this lens of Bayesian optimization, kind of the natural question to ask is, can you sort of learn a good prior to Bayesian optimization? And of course, the Bayesian paradigm offers kind of a very natural way to do so, right, which is hierarchical Bayesian modeling. So instead of hand designing a prior and then basically performing Bayesian inference or approximate Bayesian inference, what you could do is you could take a bunch of related tasks, right, a bunch of kind of training tasks, and then we try to learn kind of a hyper prior that we could then use, uh, so starting with a hyper prior, to learn a hyper posterior that could then serve as a prior for a new uh, task that you might want to run. Okay, so that's kind of a high level idea. Of course, it's a classical idea in Bayesian inference and sort of classical approaches to get engaging kind of with this paradigm, they typically operate kind of on a sort of in a parametric level. So for example, think about hierarchical modeling for linear regression, right? So a common thing to do would be to say, let me fit multiple linear models and kind of a centroid, right? Kind of a model that I shrink my coefficients towards, right? That's sort of a very classical approach. And one can do the same thing with neural nets in principle, right? Can we kind of learn sort of a neural net, right? That is my kind of my centroid model, and then sort of some other models that are sort of close by in parameter space, right? Things like mammal, for example, work in this direction. Okay. Uh, now, one key challenge here is really it's very difficult to kind of um, scale these ideas to massively over-parameterized models, and it's very difficult to specify kind of meaningful hyper-priors for very high-dimensional domains like neural networks. And so the direction that we've been exploring instead of trying to specify priors and performing this, this kind of inference on the parameter level, we sort of do it on the functional level and kind of the, the level of predictions. So we've done some work on sort of function space hierarchical Bayesian modeling. The, the idea, you can basically think about kind of this transfer learning paradigm, essentially trying to learn a flexible model, right, that sort of describes this underlying stochastic process prior. So instead of a hand design Gaussian process prior, you sort of learn the Gaussian process, the kind of the, uh, the stochastic process prior, such that then on a new task, you can basically specialize it hopefully with few examples. At first, that sounds like a completely crazy idea, right? Because instead of kind of learning a very high dimensional parametric model, now you have to learn one over infinitely many priors, right? But of course, stochastic processes are fully characterized by their finite marginals, and that's all computational algorithms really look at, right? If you use stochastic variation inference, uh, inference finite variational gradient descent, various forms of Langevin dynamics, kind of all the toolkits of approximate Bayesian inference, um, for those of you right, working in the space, kind of, right? So they really only look at kind of finite marginals. In particular, they really only look at kind of the prior score. Right, it's basically the gradient of the log density at a set of test points where you care about making predictions. That's really the crux. So if we can sort of get a good handle, sort of estimate the prior score, then we're basically in business. We can apply sort of all the standard approximate uh, inference algorithms uh, in uh, in the toolkit, and that's what we've been trying to do. And so that's an approach that uh, we've published in a paper at iClear last year basically sort of tries to implement this paradigm. So you would start with a bunch of kind of training tasks. And from those, try to estimate kind of this underlying stochastic process prior. And what this means is you basically have to get the marginals right, in particular, the score of the marginals right. right? And of course, the marginals are sort of predictions at particular sets of points where these are one dimensional marginals. Of course, generally, you care about kind of higher dimensional marginals, let's say many batches of points where you want to make predictions. Right? Maybe this is a two-dimensional marginal, just for illustration. In the context of Gaussian processes, all these finite dimensional marginals are Gaussians. But in general, they don't need to be Gaussians. Right? Of course, in general, you might uh, kind of also try to learn non-Gaussian marginals. And so what we're basically doing is, in a way, try to learn a flexible model that, given some sort of test points so where you want to make predictions, predicts the score of this underlying stochastic process. So how can you do this? You need a flexible neural network architecture. So let's just use a transformer, right? And then you need a way to in a way, estimate that score. So you use uh, score matching, right? It's kind of the two uh, key ideas that are behind LLMs and behind diffusion models, basically, right? In order to kind of, um, on the one side, really have the flexibility of absorbing large amounts of data, but also really assessing kind of distributional properties. That's basically the idea. There was a question, yes? Would be any advantage to do something like that at a hundred k? Um, so I mean, we care about really the predictions, so the outputs, 
Maybe there's alternative use cases that you would do something in between if you somehow want to maybe um, really look at kind of uncertainty in the features that are learned at different levels. It's not something we've looked at. Let's talk about it. Okay. And so this actually works pretty well. So here's some uh, experimental results discussed in this IKEA paper. Uh, so two settings, uh, there's a whole bunch of data sets that we benchmark this on, maybe two more interesting ones. So the first one is this free electron laser tuning example. So a task is basically a tuning session from one experiment where we sort of configure this complicated machine and observe kind of performance of it uh, on a different set of tasks. And then essentially you kind of learn this prior that can then use downstream in order to calibrate this machine. Another task is basically kind of learning shared models across time series. So this is a kind of a medical setting um, where each task is a patient. Uh, and essentially you get a time series observation um, uh, from uh, patients in an intensive care unit. Uh, and so each time series is a separate task. You want to kind of learn a common model and then a personalized model per patient, right? Uh, that's uh, just lets you do. And so the model, as we compare against basically a whole range of different benchmarks um, uh, for meta learning and Heracle Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian learning, um, uh, both kind of probabilistic versions and non-probabilistic versions. Uh, and so uh, the method does pretty well, both in terms of predictive accuracy, so in terms of RNSE for the, for the uh, prediction, uh, but also, and that's maybe more importantly even for these types of experimental design tasks, is really calibration of the uncertainty. Right? So it actually yields quite well calibrated uh, confidence uh, confidence estimates. This is really, we, we know very little about the theory of this approach. It works well empirically. There's very interesting theoretical questions on kind of transfer learning and sort of adaptive model selection in this closed loop settings. We've done some work in this space as well, but restricted to much simpler hypothesis classes like linear models and these sort of things. So there's also super interesting theoretical questions. Very happy to talk offline about those, uh, but uh, but I think analyzing this approach in general is going to be very hard. Okay, uh, but you can make it make it work. So here's basically some applications of this to sort of lifelong Bayesian optimization, right? This kind of setting where you would take um, past experiments from existing experimental campaigns and then use them to accelerate new campaigns, right? And so here, this is a data set um, where we don't actually do the closed loop wet lab experiments. So this is we just play back data that has been recorded. Uh, on optimizing a certain family of enzymes, binding affinity with respect to certain receptor molecules. Each task is a different receptor molecule. So we want to find a well-binding um, protein for a particular receptor. And you want to repurpose or reuse information uh, of experiments that you already have carried out. Okay, so basically for one receptor, your performance function that you would optimize, say with Bayesian optimization, would be binding affinity, right? How well does it bind? Um, and you could sort of run Bayesian optimization, but then if you want to reuse that information for kind of related tasks, right? For different receptor molecules, for example, right? And that's sort of where the transfer learning aspect comes in. We use this model, so, and these kind of models that I've described using uh, Heracle Bayesian modeling, and you actually get substantial acceleration. So this is here basically just kind of the simple regret, sort of the suboptimality gap, which we know on this data set, because really it's these, uh, these enzymes have been exhaustively screened uh, and kind of using and not using meta learning, so learning from scratch, of course, is much worse than reusing information from related tasks, right? Where we very quickly can zoom into the uh, proteins. Okay, uh, so now let me talk a little bit about um, uh, another, uh, I think, very interesting direction um, to kind of build on this idea of Bayesian optimization. Uh, and the intention here is to sort of kind of open up the black box, right? If you want to think about scientific discovery, kind of black box methods, right? Black box optimization is sort of not, you want to learn something about it, right? So I'd like to kind of really open up that black box in some sense. And so I'd like to talk about some recent work where we address this question sort of through the lens of causal discovery, right? And sort of trying to learn kind of a mechanistic model, right? A causal model of this black box. So you're gonna talk about basically structural causal models that are represented as DAGs, directed as cyclic graphs. So each of these circles is a random variable. Um, and kind of one ap motivating application uh, here and kind of uh, scientific applications is, for example, um, gene regulatory networks, how they interact with each other, and kind of what their causal impact is on phenotypical properties of a cell, for example. Okay. And now um, you can also do certain interventions that are uh, indicated by these squares here, right? In this uh, biological example, you might uh, knock down certain genes or apply drug perturbations or so, right? Interventions on these variables. And now you need to model the effect of these interventions. So the way 
this is done um, is using causal mechanisms, right? So basically describe each variable kind of as a uh, function of its parent nodes, uh, the intervention that's potentially applied to that node, plus some stochastic perturbation of it. Okay, so it's a com common model, right, of basically structural equation models. Uh, and now what you sort of want to look at, right, and also in the context of Bayesian optimization, is not just sort of generally learn about these mechanisms, but actually kind of the question is how should we intervene in order to optimize performance, right? And so we can, for example, think about one of these nodes as a reward node and try to optimize uh, the reward. Okay, so for example, you could ask, how should I intervene on these different cells, right? Um, such that um, I have a desired uh, phenotypical effect on my cell, right? That maybe it's, uh, uh, it kills malignant cells and kind of keeps healthy cells alive, right? Uh, as sort of a uh, high level motivation for this, uh, for this work. And the key challenge that we want to address here is the setting where we don't know the mechanism. So for what I'm going to talk about, we'll actually assume we know the causal structure. Also done some work where you don't know the causal structure, but for now we'll assume the direct structure, but you don't know the mechanisms. So you don't know these functions there. In this setting, and so now the question is how should we intervene in order to maximize it? And it's actually a strict generalization of this Bayesian optimization setting. Okay, and so you can basically think about kind of classical Bayesian opti uh, optimization in this way where your interventions directly have an effect on the reward nodes, right? At the immediate parents sort of of this, uh, of this reward node. Okay, and so this model-based model causal Bayesian optimization setting that I'm talking about now, in a way, is a strict generalization of this where you also have some intermediate nodes, right? For example, gene activation levels, right, of genes that you might or might not be able to intervene on. Okay, and so, I mean, there's uh, quite a bunch of work on sort of causal bandits um, uh, that make sort of different assumptions. And this is sort of in this general literature and actually generalized a, a bunch of different settings that have been uh, studied there. Okay, and so now the question is, can you sort of lift some of these ideas from Bayesian optimization uh, to this sort of setting? And that's what you want to, do, want to do. So what you're going to do is we're going to use our Bayesian model now to reason about the epistemic uncertainty in the mechanisms of this causal model. Okay, so we want to learn about how do kind of parents and interventions affect nodes that are immediate successors in the underlying DAG. Okay, so we can basically say, suppose we apply a certain intervention, right, on a subset of these genes, for example, then we could measure gene expression level, right, with respect to all, this, uh, all the genes, right, all the nodes in this network, and then basically apply regression to, on this mechanism. Right, so our confidence sets now on this mechanism to contract. Right, so this is basically what we've done before in Bayesian optimization directly on the output level with respect to the rewards, but now it's done sort of internally within this black box. Right, how these variables influence each other directly. And then, of course, now the question is how do you leverage that epistemic uncertainty in order to drive experimentation? Okay, and so what we show in this uh, in this ICLEAR paper is a way to do so that again leverages this optimism in the face of uncertainty principle, like like GPUCB basically, but now over in a way that entire um, function composition along this dark to desk graph. Okay, and so that computationally gets much more complicated. Okay, so you want to ask that question, right? Because now you have to propagate that uncertainty, and I'm actually going to explain how to do that in a simpler setting because I can do it visually. Uh, so bear with me. Yes. So just to clarify, sure. you know, you know the, the graph exactly, yes. Yes. and you also have full information, full measurements of well, the Absolutely, thanks. Uh, so I should have clarified this, absolutely. So we assume uh, in this work, we know the DAG, and, and I hadn't said that, we know, we can observe at least so noisy estimates of all the nodes. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be kind of sub gaussian noise, so similar as before. Thank you. Any other questions about the setup? Otherwise, it's really a strict generalization of this kind of idea, okay? And so you can basically, Kind of implement optimism in this. I'm going to show how that works in just a in just a second, um, and uh, and then in this case, really again get regret mounds about the resulting algorithm that can really make use of this graph structure. Actually, so you can find settings where the regret bounds here are exponentially smaller uh, than those uh, for standard Bayesian optimization. Sorry, wouldn't that be obvious that you want to do better if you have so much more information? Because yeah, you measure you every intermediate. Exactly. It's obvious in some sense. I'm saying that one should expect. To do one it. should expect. It. So I, I'm not saying it's surprising. 
right? But it's just a, it's a way to mathematically characterize and of exhibit course, instances where this is the case. But absolutely, it's not surprising, right? It should be because you have more information. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And so there's some experiments. I'm going to show you some more interesting ones later. So these are some synthetic instances that have been studied uh, by prior work, um, which this framework generalizes. And we just compare against, so it's basically there's been work in special cases of this framework. Um, and we compare against sort of their experimental setup on these special cases. And the approach does roughly the same, maybe a little better in certain cases. But it's kind of a more, maybe in a way, more general uh, way of uh, going about this. Of course, the very natural question is what happens if you don't know the DAG? What happens if you have partial observability? Lots of very interesting questions. We've done some work on what happens if you don't know the DAG. Happy to talk more about that separately, but I'm not going to do that here. And so what I want to talk now for the last part of this talk um, is a connection to control uh, and kind of reinforcement learning that I briefly mentioned, mentioned before, because it's very closely related to what we just talked about. So an alternative way to think about kind of the applications that we've discussed, like this protein example, is to have an explicit notion of state. Right, so maybe this is state of our protein. We apply a certain action, right, certain intervention, like modifying, maybe swapping out one amino acid with another one, and that maybe gives some rewards depending on how well that protein binds to its target. But of course, it also changes the state of the protein, right? So now we get sort of a different confirmation, maybe, right? And again, right, we could apply another, a second mutation, right, and see how well that corresponding structure does, and sort of keep going. Right? And of course, we could think about doing this for sort of controlling cell populations, right? designing treatment conditions and the likes. Um, and so what in a lot of applications of this in the context of scientific discovery, sort of the key challenge is that we don't really know the dynamics model. We don't really know kind of the transition kernel of that underlying model. And that's sort of the crux of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk um, here. So basically, no, so even if you have time, so, okay, so even if you have time data, right, you might not know precisely what's the effect of applying certain, certain um, mutations, for example, to the protein, right, or certain whatever, uh, knock down certain genes in a cell population or so, right? The whole purpose, right, of experimentation here is to learn something about the underlying system, learn something about the dynamics, and learn enough that you can maybe control the system. We want to sort of look at how can you learn to control this underlying by, by by learning the model. So it's what people would call uh, so indirect active. adaptive control. Yeah, sort of uh, active system identification or something. Right. That's different. Uh, so absolutely, it's related to this exactly. But sort of you want to learn enough in order to control. Okay. Good. And so uh, I'm going to talk about. So this is going to be applications in robotics, where it's easier to sort of show videos and these things, right? But uh, it's very much motivated by these scientific applications that I've described. Okay? And so, of course, this kind of picture we had is really kind of what's often referred to as reinforcement learning and sort of machine learning, adaptive control, right, uh, in the controls community. Very similar questions looked at in different perspectives, right? Okay. And so, and of course, we also have seen quite some advances in RL, in particular, the ability to scale to very large state space and state and action spaces, in particular in contexts like games or so. So it's certainly a very powerful hammer. It's also nice recent breakthroughs in robotics, right? Learning what are locomotion, drone racing, and these sort of things. Um, and so it's definitely a very powerful computational tool. Um, on the other hand, the key assumption behind much of that work is that you really basically have a perfect model of the world, right? So these models work where basically the agents sort of live in a matrix, right? Where you know precisely kind of what the consequences of actions are, right? If you whatever, play Go, you know precisely how the Go board looks once you and your opponent have taken a move. So we want to look at that setting, right? Where you don't know the consequences of your actions, okay? Um, and so, uh, right, so that's the case for, for these types of applications that we're gonna talk about, right? So you want to, in a way, make reinforcement learning work where you have kind of, at best, a very approximate uh, model of the world. And the goal is to really learn something about this underlying. And I mean, you might say, right, so reinforcement learning is kind of this abstract paradigm where you need to learn to act in unknown environments, right? But kind of standard algorithms, they're just extremely sample inefficient, right? So, uh, I mean, if you use standard policy gradient techniques, uh, you kind of need lots and lots of access kind of to samples of transition model. So what do you want to think about? is kind of an analog to Bayesian optimization. Right, so in Bayesian optimization, you're very, very conscious about the experiments you carry out, where to evaluate this black box, maybe this reward function, for example, 
but you're happy to invest lots of computation optimizing an acquisition function. So I'm happy to invest lots of computation to optimize an acquisition function here to run some policy gradient techniques that require maybe some hours or days of compute, but I don't want to waste a lot of experiments. So I want to think carefully before I act. Okay, so that's the question of how to realize that in reinforcement learning. And it's also closely related to the setting before, right? That's why I meant, want to mention it. Right? So you can just think about this as a particular DAG, right? But you know, of states identified. That's, that's mentioned. Maybe also another cartoon illustration to build some intuition here, um, right? Is so you now have a state space, you want to control some unknown uh, dynamical system, right? Maybe a set of, uh, of cells uh, or some robotic car or something like this. For now, for the illustration, we're actually going to talk about deterministic systems. So all uncertainty is really due to of epistemic nature, due to the lack of information. The algorithms, though generalized, even if you have kind of no, uh, stochastic noise driving the systems. Okay, and suppose you have kind of a starting state, you want to drive the system to a particular target state. Um, due to this epistemic uncertainty, right, the uncertainty about kind of next states, given the current state action pair that you would play, there is some uncertainty about sort of where you might end up in states. Right? So if you consider playing a certain policy, a certain sequence of actions, right, then there's a plausible set of next states that you might want to end up with. Once you carry that out, you actually see what really happens. Right? You actually get state observations. And then, of course, you can use those in order to shrink your confidence estimates, right? to reduce your epistemic uncertainty. Yeah. Um, in some sense, this assumes that you're your sequence of actions is going to explore the space well. Otherwise, you never get back. Absolutely. Yes. So, so what I'm going to focus on first or for, for this talk is what's often referred to as the episodic setting. That's what you're referring to. So you can always reset the system to the start state. That's what I was, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. And then just repeat yeah, it this, okay. right? And that's the case for many of these scientific applications, actually, because the new experiment resets in the way initial conditions. Correct. Um, we also looked at kind of the non-episodic setting. Very happy to talk with you offline about this. And so you're getting at a great point. Uh, so but let's focus on this here. It's easy to describe. And so basically now you have this information. Now you have less uncertainty, right? And you can pl uh, plan more aggressively somehow, right? And get closer to it. That's kind of the idea. Okay. And so now how do you do this um, with complex transition models like uh, neural networks, right? Or kind of Gaussian process dynamics models and these things. Okay. So here's kind of a cartoon. And that's also kind of the key algorithmic idea that's behind the al algorithm for model-based model -based optimization for the simple chain DAG, basically, right? So that the, the new system is done. Okay, so what, do you want to, what we're going to do is we're going to be optimistic. So optimism in the face of uncertainty. So we want to find introspectively optimizing acquisition function, a policy that, op that maximizes the optimistic return that's plausible according to the uncertainty in my transition model. But this was already about to ask how to do that. So I'm going to explain how to do it. OK, <laughs> so here's how to do it. Um, for, first of all, I should say that this is well known for kind of tabular MDPs, for linear MDPs, and so on, how you can do it efficiently. But for general nonlinear dynamics models, it's basically, in general, it's very difficult. And it's very difficult for two reasons. One is kind of non, right, so nonlinear dynamics, but it's also because you kind of have a very nasty non convex constraint set also, right, of your plausible dynamics, right, that are very complicated. Okay, so we want to kind of optimistically control this agent to get to a goal state. So this is the simplest cartoon I could come up with. So basically here, x-axis is time, you could come up with, uh, and the y-axis is uh, the states. Um, and so basically we just want to move up. Good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find a policy, which is basically just an action, uh, that would tell us kind of what uh, the next state we would end up with. And let's... This the note here basically this non nominal next state, kind of the posterior mean in some sense, right, of our next state. But we have some epistemic uncertainty around it, right? These are kind of one step confidence bounds uh, around it. Okay, and so now what you're going to do is we're going to let the agent choose its luck. Okay, so we'll afford the agent additional control authority to control where within the plausible next states that are afforded with respect to the epistemic uncertainty of the agent it wants to end up with. Okay? And so now this requires kind of some assumptions on how these uncertainty sets are represented. Okay? So we are working here kind of with ellipsoidal um, confidence sets, right? They're motivated from Gaussian processes and these sort of things, right? or basically rectangular ones or so, I can do this in different ways, um, which basically admit kind of a simple reparameterization. So in a way, what happens 
is basically you control right? when you control where to end up with in your next state. That happens is what happens is you basically replace the original dynamics model by kind of an optimistic dynamics model, but you have some additional control variables, a policy that would in a way say where you would end up with if you were to play that action. Okay, so the agent controls its luck, that's the intuition. Okay, so this gives us an optimistic next state. We go unroll further, right? And this way construct an optimistic trajectory denoted by the green tildes here, that then uh, optimistically reaches the goal. Okay, and so what really has happened here is we replace this original very difficult problem where you optimize the outer level over a policy, but inner level over this complicated nonlinear constraint set of plausible dynamics, simply by kind of a standard approximate dynamic programming problem over a larger lack of decision process. Okay, so it basically happens you just in a way augment the action space. Okay. I think the way you drew it, it looked very greedy, like. Yeah, absolutely. It's greedy. Yes, absolutely. Right, it's optimistic. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of, right. That's kind of the effect that you get. Right. So so uh, absolutely, it's the right intuition. But you can actually do the same thing for kind of being cautious. Right. You can do the same thing for being pessimistic as a reason about constraint satisfaction. So there's a whole separate line. Of, that's the safe RL work. Right. Kind of the pessimistic side of, of optimistic. Okay. Let's get back to that. So okay. Um, good. And so now here's kind of the simplest cartoon illustration on sort of the invented, uh, inverted pendulum task. Uh, you want to swing up that pendulum. So what's going to do is you basically start with a prior that knows nothing about physics, right? So it, the only prior information is some sort of smoothness. So similar actions will have similar effects. It's kind of the inductive bias. So basically the optimistic trajectory will just think if I push in one direction, I'm going to swing up the pendulum and stay there. And of course, that's not how the world works. So once you actually carry it out, it's going to swing in the down state a little bit, but it visits kind of relevant parts of the state space and learns something about what happens there. Conditioning on that, just two episodes later, it figured out that you actually have to swing in the other direction to gain enough momentum to swing up, but it sort of doesn't quite pan out, but you kind of get relevant information over a larger part of the state space. Okay, and so now just a little later, um, you're actually able to swing up, you sh slightly overshoot, because it hasn't collected any data on the top state and the swung up state. And then basically two episodes later, essentially found a policy where the optimistic and the true trajectory really agree. Okay, and so basically found an optimal solution. It's kind of the simplest example. You can run these on the standard deep RL benchmarks, right? It's kind of half cheetah robots and so on. Here's some comparison against other exploration techniques uh, that, for example, just do a certain equivalent control, just optimize an expectation or do posterior sampling, Thompson sampling. And here, optimistic sampling maybe does a little bit better in kind of standard formulations of this benchmark, but it actually does a lot better if you regularize the problem, if you basically increase action penalties. So if you try to find controls that are not as aggressive, right? That sort of try to keep control costs small as well. And the problem is that kind of standard policy gradient algorithms, if you have sort of these types of regularizing effects, they quickly converge to doing nothing, right? Because any action sort of costs you something. So you quickly learn to have drive your costs to zero, but you actually have to do a lot in order to kind of reach a sparse reward state, right? And so uh, this optimistic effect kind of counteracts this, right? It really makes you stick with the action, right? Because you can sort of, uh, in a way, afford longer horizons for exploration in some sense. That's the intuition, right? So let me maybe, uh, okay, so here's just some illustrations of what happens if you learn without kind of action penalties. I'm not sure if one can see the video, then sort of, right, just by wildly uh, kind of vigorously waving with your extremities, you kind of, get information by the chance you move forward, you probably wouldn't want to explore a real robot this way, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably not a good idea, right? Um, and so kind of if you have these more regularizing, right, kind of action penalties, then you're a little bit more careful at least. And, uh, but at the same time, the exploration problem becomes harder. These are point-wise action penalties or? Like yeah, or just whatever, L2 penalty of the controls. At each time. At each time step, yes, exactly. Okay, so now here's kind of a, uh, a kind of demonstration of this approach on like a little race car. It's not a particularly complicated control problem, uh, but you want to learn it to control it from scratch, right? So basically, again, no physical prior or something like this. So the first, the description of the task, right? So basically, you want to reverse car, reverse park that, that car in the spot. Um, it's a little bit tricky because there's slippage and so on, right? Some materials effects and so on, right? So really getting the physics right is actually non, uh, non-trivial. Um, and so now here is basically just this model-based uh, RL approach. If you learn from scratch, 
Uh, so, uh, of course, initially you know nothing about physics, so it drives off wildly a different uh, direction. Um, right? This is kind of your reset always to the same starting point, the episodic setting we've described. And after about 20 episodes or so, it roughly uh, gets the job done. Now, for this task, arguably, you wouldn't use model-based RL with no physics knowledge from scratch. Right? Maybe the much more standard straw man would be to uh, do SysID, right? So maybe fit the parametric model, first principle model to data, and then uh, derive a feedback controller and run it, right? And so here, this is what happens um, basically if you do this. So it kind of solves the task uh, pretty well. Of course, there's some sort of sim to real gap because the system is this is just a bicycle model, right? A very, very simple kind of dynamics model that doesn't capture all that's going on. Of course, you can do better if you use richer uh, kind of uh, physical models, but that's sort of a challenge, right? If you use kind of an under, right? Uh, um, a, 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 too, a too simple model for, for this sort of task. So the question, of course, now is can you combine the best of both worlds, right? And so one way to do this, just to close the loop in the talk as well, right, um, is as follows. And so we've basically been, so, so kind of the way we've been thinking about this is basically simulators are really useful, right, of physical knowledge. So is there a good, is there a good way, generic way of sort of compiling a simulator into a prior? that we could use for these tasks. Okay, and so what we did is we basically just used this approach that I've described to you earlier, right, the score-based meta learning approach, where each task just comes from a simulator, right? You basically simulate a whole bunch of different dynamics models with different environmental constants and so on. So there's no estimation of these constants, right? It just generates plausible, plausible um, physical scenarios and then essentially extracts um, a, a prior right, from essentially these simulations. And then we use those downstream, right? So again, all you need is really the score of this prior. And so if you do this, then uh, already in the first episode, it sort of goes in the right direction. Um, after about five episodes, it gets sort of maybe similar as this uh, uh, parametric approach I've described. After 10, it roughly solves it, and after, and then it keeps refining this a little. So it's certainly a lot more sample efficient, right? And where do you start doing something more reasonable? So here's some more quantitative experiments in the paper. Um, so the first is the following. So what you do is we have some, we collect a bunch of data um, by driving around the car and collecting sort of uh, state observations. We have a validation set that we use to predict the effect of actions on new states. And we use different learning algorithms, right, to compile the same training data into predictions on the holdout data. And the first approach is basically this parametric misspecified uh, society approach, right? That of course is bounded by the bounded hypothesis class. Or so, right? If you use more complex models, you can of course do much better. Um, here is kind of the uninformed prior I've described that initially does really bad, but eventually does better because you can kind of learn this data-driven uh, right representation. Um, this here is something I haven't talked about. It's also very natural straw man, kind of the gray box approach. But in a way, you use the physical model as kind of a mean, and then you learn a deviation from that mean. That also helps. Uh, but here, actually, using kind of the simulation-based prior, uh, you can not just start at a better position, but also find better solutions. And so here is really kind of a, uh, a version of the video I've showed. Um, basically, really, these are closed-loop experiments. On one side, using this uninformed prior, um, x-axis is the number of episodes, y is the performance, right? And the blue one is basically just using the simulator-based prior, right? That uses transfer learning across related tasks, starts off in a better place, and gets to kind of the same solution much faster. So that's basically what I wanted to talk about. So I think there's many more exciting challenges, right? And I think if you really want to kind of realize this potential of AI for aiding scientific discovery, it's not only about getting the most out of some data we've collected, but we also really have to think about how we can put machine learning uh, in the loop to drive these discovery tasks. And so I think one of the key challenges here, and I think this is something where really in, it's, it's amazing to see the progress in LLMs and diffusion models and uh, kind of generative AI, so to say, right? One issue that they consistently face and that's not at all resolved is kind of careful uncertainty quantification. And I think that's really needed if you want to go to scientific discovery tasks, if you really want to go where no one has gone before, right? And uh, so uh, we're lucky in Switzerland, the next generation of our supercomputer in Lugano is going to come online uh, pretty soon. And there are some nice opportunities and also trading larger scale models. I think that's really fundamental questions on how to do proper uncertainty quantification in sort of this age of foundation models and gen AI and so on. So I think there's lots more to do. So I'd like to end by thanking uh, all the amazing students, postdocs, and senior collaborators uh, who did the work that I've uh, presented. And uh, 
the funding agencies. And of course, thank you all uh, for listening and for coming to the talk. Any questions? We had a few during the talk over here. Yeah, we so had a few during the talk. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is feeding off a little bit from the discussion we had sure. earlier. Maximizing the ad uh, that's where you use English differentiation. So there's no so maximizing what? I didn't hear you. When you were maximizing the uh, mistake, there was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sure. So, okay. No, we didn't use it there. Uh, so that's maybe something to look at. So I really treat this as kind of a bi-level problem or so. And maybe, so, so, uh, so what we really did is we actually got rid of DNA optimization, right? We really reparameterized the problem that is a single level, but kind of over a, a different MDP. So both pi really a reduction, yeah. And, and I, I either of the two models with the neural network, the pi or the eta. Or yeah, both. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So, so we basically learn a policy, right? Some neural network controller that tells you which action to pick where, and the eta, right? This kind of epistemic variables. There are also some neural network. Right? So, but in the end, it's just kind of a, the the pol So it's basically just a, a kind of a, a policy over a larger state action space, right? That optimizes kind of both of our actions and next states in some sense, right? The epistemic and certain. This, by the way, this reparameterization idea. Um, it's actually very widely used for those of you working in, in kind of uh, Bayesian inference and uh, Bayesian deep learning and so on. Very widely used kind of the reparameterization trick for, say, stochastic I mean, black box variational inference and these kind of ideas. And in a way, we repurpose it for control here. That's the idea. Okay. Does that imply some kind of like closed form solution? I mean, because you were working on analytics or no? Not necessarily, no. No, I mean, in a way, it kind of, so. Um, you still have to res solve that resulting kind of approximate dynamic programming problem. But this is kind of in standard form, so to say, right? You can throw whatever policy gradient technique you like at it, right? And find good local solutions, right? This is kind of where, whatever, right? So given the progress in robotics or manipulation or so, right? Or uh, drone racing, so show what, what can be done, right? So in a way, kind of you learn, you learn the simulator, right? You kind of learn, um, the model that you should be optimizing. But it takes kind of the uncertainty into account, so it drives exploration in the right direction. Questions? Um, how, would, how would you add the safety? Aha, OK, good. Th thanks, thanks for that. So, um, so we also have done, done quite a bit of, so, so this is kind of all about optimism in the face of uncertainty, right? Uh, now, if you think about kind of exploration, right, um, in simulation, Exploration is only a computational concern, right? If you think about exploration by really interacting with the real world, maybe a real robot or so, right? Uh, then uh, maybe being too optimistic is also not the way to go. And so one can use very similar ideas to the ones I've described to not only reason about kind of optimistic consequences of your actions, but can also pessimistic consequences of your actions. For example, we've done some work where you can use this epistemic uncertainty, these confidence sets, so for example, do stability verification. Right, or kind of reasoning about um, constraint satisfaction right, of a given policy right, under all plausible dynamics. So uh, um, also similar reparameterization ideas to kind of try to solve them even within that policies and so on. So that's a different talk. But, uh, so it's kind of the pessimistic flip side of what, what I talked about. Any questions? Regarding the, the um, the graph structure? Why if you don't know the graph structure? Mm -hmm. what, what would you do? Yeah, so I mean one one thing we have done is uh, we've done some work on sort of being Bayesian about the structure, right? Sort of trying to quantify uncertainty in the structure. And so there's some nice work by um, by Lars, uh, so Lars Leuch, a student in the group, um, sort of who, who looked at um, kind of a differential approach for doing uh, Bayesian structure learning. So basically combining ideas from variational inference, in particular Stein variational gradient descent, which is sort of a particle-based technique for representing multiple hypotheses about graph structures. Um, and uh, using them together with, I mean, that's work. Um, so uh, um, 
kind of uh, differentiable regularizers that kind of encourage acyclicity of learned graphs, right? The no-tiers approach. So for those of you working in the space, that kind of this builds upon in some sense, but turns it into the Bayesian prior and some certainly quantification around it. That's sort of some work. Uh, it's very hard to sort of analyze what happens in this context. It's a nice heuristic. We've also done some work on combining this with active learning and kind of Bayesian optimization, but it's harder to say something meaningful theoretical about it. When we were looking at interventions, yeah, singleton interventions or also combined activity multiple. Yeah, so, so here this is really about multiple, right? Really about addressing this combinatorial space. So typically, right, if you have one site, right, and if you there's I mean, twenty choices, right? And, has, and how did you address them? Yeah, I mean, so um, for kind of on the work I talked about at the beginning, kind of right, so the really scientific collaborations. This was typically a limited number of sites. Right, so um, I think in the second example I showed it's like five different uh, sites, right, and then essentially 20 amino acids per site or so, right. Uh, it's like three million, like something like this, possible candidates that are very difficult to synthesize experimentally, but very easy to sort of search through uh, sort of computationally, right. So it's a kind of a nice use case for Bayesian optimization. So there you could exhaustively optimize the acquisition function in some sense. Okay, so. Um... Let's thank the speaker again. And, um...